Want to sell more books? Make sure you're at the Self-Publishing Show live this summer. Meet the biggest names in self-publishing at Europe's largest conference for independent authors. Enjoy two days packed with special guests, an exclusive networking event, and a digital ticket for watching the professionally filmed replay, including bonus sessions not included at the live show. Head over to selfpublishingshow.com slash tickets and secure your spot now. The Self-Publishing Show Live is sponsored by Amazon KDP. On this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. The AI is not capable of going, oh, these words should go in here, this word should come out. It's not capable of doing that. So I think of my artificial intelligence, my pseudo-write, as like the junior interns in the writing room. And I'm going yes or I'm going no. And I'm prompting them of what I want. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Do you remember what it is we've got to announce? We had lots of notes before this recording session. Um, I think it's just the TikTok webinar. And also the live the shows. Live yeah. show, which people have just heard about. But we will also uh, remind you that you have four days left if you want to spread your payments for the live show over four equal installments of £50 rather than the 199 uh, straight up or the 200 straight up. Um, so that finishes at the end of the 28th of February, at midnight 28th of February. So if you want to do that, go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash forward slash SPS live, but of course tickets hopefully will still be on sale. And I don't think we're going to sell out in February, but we'll let you know in the Facebook group if that's looking likely. I think we will sell out before we get to the conference, but not just yet. Uh, Mark, what else are we going to talk about? So we mentioned the TikTok webinar, weren't we? We are. We're going to learn uh, about TikTok, using TikTok to sell your books, free live training, one of our regular training sessions. If you want to sign up for that, go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash learn TikTok. I will see you in there because I'm looking forward to that one as well. Okay, well, we have a guest today who writes Jaff. Do you know what Jaff is, Mark? Uh, Jane Austen fan fiction. Yeah, I do. Yes, I know. And I know Elizabeth very well. Elizabeth Ann West, um, who has been uh, on cables, I remember, back in the day. Um, I've had a, uh, been in touch with her a few times over the years and she's um yeah she's done very well she's apart from the fact that she you know she's she's uh, wrote some good books and done well she's also had some interesting pricing strategies i don't know if she mentioned that in the webinar into the webinar they into she um she was one of the first authors i can think of who was um, selling 9.99 as the as her price point and doing really well at that level which i was always found that quite encouraging uh, that you know readers will be prepared to pay a higher price than most indies would charge so um elizabeth's been a bit of a pioneer on that front and and latterly has has started working with scribe count and all kinds of interesting things that she, that she does and pseudo right yes yeah, uh, scribe count as well she works with yes. um with well, randall and um yeah pseudo right as well she's she's making she's pushing quite hard into the ai space which is is interesting at the moment yes I think the pricing one is interesting and, and the point that she makes in the interview is that a lot of fans and your your fans definitely will be the same want to support you mm -hmm. there's no way of tipping somebody um on a book but she does give the opportunity for people i mean how many people do you send a free copy of your book out and then they go and buy it because they want to be want to be supportive of their author and oh yeah yeah that does have in the advanced readers yeah they'll they'll get a copy that they will then they'll then help me with so they're generous enough to do that and then they'll also go and buy it which is you know extremely generous because they they've all they've already as far as i'm concerned more than justified the fact that i sent them a free copy but they do it anyway which is lovely yeah yeah so that's part of that pricing strategy and anyway, lots uh, to, lots to talk about with elizabeth Ann west including we do have a chunk we talk a lot about jane austen then a lot about ai which is a slightly unusual um, a set of subjects, but nonetheless, very entertaining. Here's Elizabeth. This is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Elizabeth Ann West, welcome to the self publishing show. How are you? Great. I've had a very exciting week. <laughs> Have you? 
I joined Sudorite officially. So that software, I was running around in yeah. Vegas showing everybody. Um, I'm now the community and education lead for um, Sudorite. Do you know, it's funny, you know people virtually in this world and occasionally meet at conferences. I honestly think I've spent more time with you in person over the years than virtually. Because you're, you've been, I think we've been at the yeah. same conferences for five or six years in a row. Yeah, that's correct. Like since pre-COVID days. Pre-COVID. Do you remember those? Yes, <laughs> vaguely. Vaguely. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk a couple of things. But what I really want to talk to you about is derivative fiction, which is a thing. <laughs> um, and uh, we're going to get into that. But we also will talk AI because it's a bit of a buzz topic at the moment. I guess it will be for the next 200 years or so until the robots eventually <laughs> kill us all. And that'll be that. Um Let's talk about you to start off with. Why don't you give us the uh, the lowdown on who Elizabeth Ann West is? Sure. I'm an accidental writer. Uh, I got paid $7 for my first article in 07 for SEO long distance relationship tips. And I was like, I can do this. Um, so I was an SEO writer for about four years. I was folding laundry and heard uh, Joe Conrath talk about uh, indie publishing, the be the monkey, not the frog, and hearing all the skills you need such as websites and uh, controlling your career online and realized I had all of those skills. So my first book was Indie in 2011. I think the same year as Mark Dawson, actually. Wow. And uh, I've been off to the races since then. In 2014, I made a shift. Uh, I was a book marketer for a few years after my first book. In 2014, I made a shift to my favorite genre to read. It was like a, my guilty pleasure that I kept secret. And that was uh, Jane Austen fan fiction. And it's a niche of a niche of a niche. Because you have romance, and you have historical romance, then you have Regency, and then you have Jeff. <laughs> um, but the Trad Pub had been in the space from like 2005 till about 2009, 2010, after the movie with Kira Knightley and Matthew McFadden. Um, And they left, like they were no longer publishing in it, but readers still wanted books. And I think that's a space that indies can jump into very easily when you find those little pockets of readers who still need books. Yeah. And that's been my career since 2014. Okay. Well, let's, I tell you, let's talk about Jane Austen for a bit and then, then we can broaden it out a little bit to sort of that type of, um, of writing. I mean, Jane sure. Austen, one of, one of the world's great writers. And I, it's probably not a natural book for me to have read. I read Rothering Heights, a few other that I had to read at school. I didn't do any Jane Austen at school, but the 1995 BBC production with Colin Firth, and I think it's Elizabeth Earl, her name mm -hmm. is, Jennifer Earl. Jennifer Earl. That's Earl. it, Jennifer Earl. I, I mean, I just thought it was unbelievable. And I've studied that so much in my own. And that got me... Read, I've read the book twice since then. And I've read Emma. And it's she's so witty and so brilliant. And one of those writers that just has this incredible talent. So there's, there's a reason why Jane Austen, people are slightly obsessed with her. And if you haven't read a Jane Austen book, it doesn't matter whether you're a sci-fi nerd, a uh, thriller man like me, you will love the writing. It's compelling, uh, page-turning, satirical tongue-in-cheek it's everything you don't think a posh 17th or 19th century oh no 17th century book is going to be you think it's going to be all literary and a uh, highfalutin it's actually it's actually a comedy i think they're comedies aren't they uh -huh. they are i think uh people forget that austin was a contemporary writer of her time and she skewers everybody from yeah. the clergy to the wealthy to even sometimes the poor um in like emma uh with miss bates um, so she was observing, and I think that we owe a lot of our current, uh, literature to her start because we now have comedy and romantic comedy, um, and things like that. And she was kind of the forefront of, of that romantic comedy novel. Yeah. So I would say again, that 95, but I don't know where it is available today, but if it, for me, I, I I've taken and it can take a leave all the other adaptations. None of them come close to that. It looks a little bit dated in the way it's filmed, but the, the acting in that, the ca the casting is sublime all the way through. Um, and the monster of Mrs. Bennett, which is done beautifully uh, <laughs> uh, all the way through um, by Alison Sturman, I should say. Now, let's talk about writing Jane Austen. So you're right. This is a lot of people write Jane Austen fiction. And we've had Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, I think, in the UK. We've had Lost in yep. Austin, which was a, an ITV series, an independent series here in the UK about women who got transported time travel back. And uh -huh. these are two examples of, if you go into the book side of things, particularly indie, there is a plethora of versions of Jane Austen, right? So, so, it's, so it's got its own audience. It does have its own audience. And um, it's an audience that's 
uh, mature and um, what's the word? Okay, it has money. That's the big thing. Okay. Like, you're not writing for an audience that are people who don't have uh, money to spend on books. These are people who who love reading. Reading is their number one hobby. Um, I always tease other authors that I was my reader zero. And before I wrote Jaff, like I'd have a $50 to $100 budget a week and it just shut up and take my money. I just need the books. Like I, I just need the things that are my favorite things to do. And I loved reading as a mom, as a young mom, because it was the only activity I got to do by myself. Like when you're a young mom, you don't even go to the restroom by yourself. There's little fingers under the doors or banging on the doors. But if I'm sitting there with my Kindle uh, while my daughter is watching Shaun the Sheep or something like that, um, I can be reading and I can be in 1812 Regency England, which is kind of like a fantasy escape. Like I know it's historical, but truthfully, it's historical fiction. So it's not it's not really accurate. There's no chamber pots. Nobody's, you know, they're not showing the. Yeah. The real grittiness of living in 1812 England. It's all um, fantasy and, and, and pretty, pretty gowns, basically. Yes, yes. And, and, and politics people, I should say, to get my centuries right, 18th century, 1700s, before somebody says not 1700s, because that's, so that's 1600s. She actually started writing them in the late 1700s, which okay. would be 18th century. Okay. They're published in the 19th century, uh, any time okay. between 18, 1811. And she actually self-published believe it or not. So Pride and Prejudice was this huge success. She only made 500 pounds from it and she was mad. So she self-published the next book, which I believe was Sense and Sensibility, and it didn't do as well. Uh, so even Jane Austen, like like emulating her, I even like aspire her career of like, oh, she was a self-publisher too. How would she have distributed it in those days? That's amazing. Uh, 500 pounds, by the way, not to be sniffed at in 1811 no. around there. But uh, no. yeah, so, but the, the period is, it's because 19th century was a, big transformational century but this is early mm -hmm. this is this feels to me more when you look at it it's, it's horse, horses and carts um and yes. you know, uh, it's it's farm farm machinery pulled by animals um okay so so where did you start then is this something as it sounds like you started as a fan of this type of of fiction of jane austen fan fiction I did. So the everybody loves the 1995 bbc series and i will confess so i'm not the only I, one because you, you mentioned like it. you mentioned the film, but yes. So I had to watch the BBC series in school. So here in the states, they teach Pride and Prejudice, not so much the Bronte sisters as much as part of the canon. So we had to do Pride and Prejudice in school. And at eighteen, I hated it. I was like, "Why are these people walking in rooms and worried about getting married?" Like it was the antithesis of my experience as an eighteen-year-old in the twenty twentieth twenty first century. So, um, or twentieth century, and. Uh, so in 2005, though, I was married, and now all of a sudden I understood how important it is of a decision of who you marry, especially now that I'm divorced. Uh, but... <laughs> yes, it's still not an insignificant decision, but your but your not livelihood, you could your family could could go into starvation with the wrong decisions. It really can, even today. And huh. I don't think I had that. I don't think I had that ability to understand that at 18. I didn't have that universal understanding. A little bit later, a few years later, I did. And the 2005 movie, the the cinematography of it is what sold me. Like, I wanted to walk on those, uh, the cliffs and up Oakham Mount. And I wanted, like, it made your country look absolutely gorgeous. And I, I wanted to go live in that space. Um, now, not so much. It's a bit drafty. <laughs> now that I watch the film, I'm like, yeah. everybody's probably just really cold all the time. Really cold. Uh, but... It, it, it's what made me fall in love. And there's actually parts of it, of that particular movie, uh, the, the director of it was doing throwbacks to another favorite movie section of mine, which is like the 80s 16 Candles and the Brat Pack. So if you watch the commentary on the film, at the very end of the film, uh, the Americans actually got an additional scene that the UK audience did not, oh. where Darcy and Elizabeth are are like kissing over candles and stuff. And it's supposed to be like a throwback to 16 candles at the end okay. with Jake and um, Wally Ringwald's character. Okay. I'm, I'm not distressed that we didn't get that extra scene, but anyway, um, I only watched that film once. I did. <laughs> I didn't, uh, for, I, I didn't particularly enjoy it. I have to say, I think because I have sort of fixed ideas and that's, that's the thing I'm going to come on to really about writing fan fiction is that people have very developed ideas of, okay. of the author we've spoken to somebody this year or in the, in the last 12 months who now writes Agatha Christie and that's a, on behalf of the family and that's a big 
ask, but Jane Austen of such a sp specific type of writing, it seems like quite a dangerous thing to do as well as a thing you want to do. I have a one-star review that's my absolute favorite that says the ghost of Jane Austen should haunt me. Because some reader was angry <laughs> and they were like, this is terrible. The ghost of Jane Austen should haunt you. And I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. So that, I mean, that's that's the danger, isn't it? Because people are not coming it to is. you as Elizabeth Ann West saying, oh, I wonder what this author's style's like. They're coming up to you thinking, how good is she going to match my expectation of what a Jane Austen book should be like? Absolutely. Um, but I think also there's, so I have my readers who follow me. Um, I have my mighty following that I built. Uh, I blog my chapters on my website. So I created a membership site very early on. Okay. Um, didn't charge for it. So this is before everyone else is doing Patreon and things like that. I started selling direct in 2016 with Gumroad and did well with that. And uh, so my readers are loyal to me and they like my stories. And I don't worry about who I can't serve. I only worry about the readers I can serve. Yeah. Um, and I think that that can help anyone in any writing career, that if you focus, if you start focusing on the people who are fans of you and building that out and finding more people who are like that, um, you can save yourself a lot of grief if you're not able to get those uh, larger, white, wider audiences. Yeah. What is it about Jane Austen, do you think? I, mean, I can understand Agatha Christie books that are going to be written. They're going to be set in the 30s. They're going to look and feel like picking up an Agatha Christie book. But the the canon, to use that word he's used, of, of Jane Austen works includes sci-fi and zombie and horror and comedy as well as traditional Jane Austen. There's something about that universe she created. Yeah, I think that... So I think it's a fantasy of the fact that you get this happily ever after, even if you're advocating for yourself. There's a funny meme, uh, mem, meme that was running around for a little bit that was like, Jane Austen says, he will change for me. Um, Bronte says, we'll be miserable together. And Shelley says, I will make him. And okay. so it's, it's, it's all of these female writers at a time period that you have kind of the early starts of mass press. So um, some of the technological advances that they were dealing with in the early 1800s are similar to what we're dealing with with the internet, believe it or not. So there's almost like a start of, dare I say, feminism, but not feminism necessarily in the sense that we're going to burn our bras, but actually women who are communicating and, and stepping up and saying, I'm going to take control of my own life. And yeah. that was very different for, for time periods before that, at least being able to write it down and, and put it out there for other people to, to read and, and follow along with. Yeah. Well, I have always thought there's a bit of a comparison between Frankenstein and Emma, isn't there? Because she does create a, <laughs> she creates a monster in Emma. Um, and I think Clueless must be an adaptation of Emma, is it, is it not? It's, it's that... Take. Clueless is absolutely yeah. an adaptation of, so you, of Emma. You yes. create something. So I do wonder if Mary Shelley was almost a nod. Mary Shelley herself was doing a bit of an Austin. She wrote it very quickly, didn't she? Yeah, I'm anyway. Right. Emma Emma's trying to make someone in her image uh, with um, her friend, uh, S, not S, Harriet. She's Harriet, trying to make yeah. Harriet in her own image. And then, you know, Shelley's kind of taking that a, further, a step yes. further. Yeah, yeah. In a slightly horror way. Um, yeah, so, so you set out... Uh, first of all, let's deal with the copyright stuff. I mean, Jane Austen, presumably, yeah. out of copyright, but still being... I mean, you can still buy the Jane Austen books new. So is that just one of those things that I could publish Jane Austen books if I got hold of the text? Or not? So you could, technically, but the KDP rules... Uh, in the early days of KDP, everybody was publishing public domain stuff left and right, and they've kind of put a damper on that. So now if you want to publish, like, Pride and Prejudice, you need to be adding some illustrations in there or some annotations if you personally want to do it. Okay. Um, same thing with any public domain work that unless it's a public domain work that's not already easily available in ebooks, because we're getting more and more access to public domain work. And a lot of them are just like OCD scanned. So it's like rubbish. I mean, it's terrible. The It's just like a page that they scanned or whatever. So if you took the time to type it up and put it in an ebook and there's nothing else in the store, you, you can publish that on KDP. Okay, but in terms of copyright for the characters and the universe and the name, it's all long, long died 80 years after she did. Oh, yes. Um, actually, I think because it was so old at the time, by the early, early 20th century when they were making those copyright rules, they'd already decided like everything before 1923 was fair game. Okay. So it was, it was in that first crop of like, well, we're not going to deal with anything that old. It's not just um, at Austin. There's Dickens is completely copyright. That's uh, copyright free public domain. That's why we get Scrooge, Scrooge every couple of years yep. at Christmas time. Uh, 
Sherlock is now 100% fully public yep. domain. That's why we keep seeing those uh, reincarnations and everything. Uh, so big movie studios and New York publishing, they don't want to play licensing fees either. Yeah. Um, so public domain is, is a really great opportunity, I think, for authors. And then how, how did you decide what you were going to bring to this, this big area of Jaff? So, again, I was reader zero. So I wrote the stories that I wanted to read. I started off with just, you know, stories that I wanted to see happen. And I think that that's a good place to start. Um, I think if you're going to write fan fiction, definitely read some. Uh, you, you'll probably find some cringe moments because a lot of them are amateur writers. But get involved, start, you know, giving reviews and telling them like great job and giving them small pointers where they can improve if you want to. Uh, but it's a great opportunity to mash up, especially I, I think like one of my presentations, I was talking about this um, Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson is completely a uh, public domain freak. And there's people who are writing like tropical capers now modern. And I'm like, you could you could kit bash them. You could you could yeah. bash them up together and you could start getting some of this this audience. It makes it easier for keywords. It makes it easier for keywords for advertising. Um, I've paid like less than five cents a click on Jane Austen and Mr. Darcy and, and different keywords and things like that. Pemberley, Longbourn, those kinds of keywords that um, are easier for me to get advertising on. So your um, your covers and your marketing have to be very Jane Austen. You, you have to use Jane Austen in the title somewhere. It's a very specific thing. Or do your books occasionally get picked up by somebody who wants to read a a Regency or sort of classic romance novel without realizing? So there is some crossover. Like I've had book bug deals that have put my books in the top 100 on the Amazon store. Um, but that doesn't necessarily translate to all of my books do that, obviously. Um, so there's definitely that core readership. And then it is something, if it's a big enough public domain property and you, you do do a big marketing push behind it, you can kind of capture some of that wider audience. But they're not going to be super fans in the sense that they want all six books public domain. They're they're kind of like in it for the um, the looky loo or the curiosity of it. Kind of like the people who like Pride and Precious and Zombies, but didn't necessarily translate over to Jeff wholeheartedly as full fans. If yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. So it it does. Okay. So in terms of the writing process, I guess this is going to be this. I mean, you've written novels before. This is going to be the same thing that we all fret about in characterization and and story beats and so on. Um, just with the added overhang or context of being in a universe created by this amazing writer a couple of hundred years away ago. I think it's easier, actually. A lot of my work's done for me. There's entire timelines of Pride and Prejudice, all the character lists. Any piece of research that I'd want to do, somebody's already done it. And right. I just have to Google it. And we don't know a lot about Jane Austen, do we? There's very few. Is what one or two images of her, and she wasn't, as you say, from a huge family, she wasn't massively wealthy at the time of her life. Well, there's some controversy. I have a controversial uh, opinion about Jane Austen that um, not everybody shares. So um, a lot of her relatives burned her letters after her death. And there was really only one or two reasons that somebody burned your letters after you died in that time period. And that's usually because you were either someone who was LGBTQ or you were somebody who was involved in affairs and things like that. Um, she did have a female companion who lived with her in her later years with her family. She did. She was proposed to. And she said, like, she said yes. And then, like, sobered up the next morning and was like, no, very much no. <laughs> um, so, and I think it's interesting, too, because she had a very wealthy brother who could have very easily taken care of her. And there was some kind of something there where he didn't really step up like he should have uh, what would have been expected norms for the time period. So, obviously, everyone's going to come at it from their own point of view and their own extrapolation. But I think that Austin probably led a, a more exciting life than we give her credit for. I don't think she was really just like sitting in a room while spinster by herself and um, not not having a full life. I think she did. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the letters were burned that we would learn from. Yeah. What a shame. Uh, are there any yep. other artists? Um, we, you mentioned we've mentioned Christie and Sherlock Holmes Dickens. I mean, I don't see a huge amount of Dickensian fan fiction or if I, I'm just not looking in the right place mostly it is the Christmas Carol that's the number one property that everybody does uh, a twist on sometimes people will do twists on great expectations um, not so much I don't think all over but um, the other big one is Alice in Wonderland Lewis Carroll okay. you will find all kinds I mean the Matrix the movie the Matrix is literally 
Alice in Wonderland fan fiction if you watch it. Follow the White Rabbit, Red Pill or Blue Pill. I mean, it's it's pretty funny. Um, another very popular one is Wizard of Oz. So that's another, like we have Wicked, which is a big uh, popular um, property, but that's also fan fiction. So you can find these different uh, audiences or people who, who love it and um, twist it for your own needs for whatever write, whatever book you're writing. I think somebody was talking about a cyber, you could do like a cyber thriller, uh, Wizard of Oz, for example. If you're like somebody trying to find like the ultimate hacker or whatever, who's behind all the the wizard, so to speak, who's behind yeah. the, the big heist and everything. Yeah. Wizard of Oz, of course, is much quoted in in the list of stories. In fact, it's in that Pixar list, I think, of the of the 20 stories that exist. And it's the yeah. um, you already have what you ne- think you need. You already have what you think you yes. need is the Wizard of Oz story, which is you'll see in lots of films and it's a good theme to have for mm-hmm. your for your character. OK, so where are you with your your uh, series? Elizabeth? have you done one series of, of Jane Austen or you do standalones or? All of the above. I have a novella series. Uh, that's the Seasons of Serendipity. I have a novel series that I'm finishing this year. That's The Moralities of Marriage. So that's getting book six. And I have a bunch of standalones as well. So a standalone that did really well last year for me in December was A Test of Fire. And it was, I just wanted to make Mr. Darcy a fireman. So I wow. put a fire at the Meriton Assembly. And so Elizabeth went running in to go save Jane. And he went running in after Elizabeth. And he carries Elizabeth out. And I mean, so if you go at it from a reader of like what fantasy do you want to see in the on the page, uh, it makes it easy to decide what project to do next. <laughs> I can see him running in with a couple of buckets and uh, yes, Mr. Sands. You know, his shirt his shirt sleeves up, no coat, yeah. crawbot's gone, and he's carrying Elizabeth out. I mean, just swoon, yes. right? <laughs> there you go. Um, and so you you do the novellas. Let me ask you about that because you're not doing the novellas as as lead magnets as giveaways you're doing them as a series because they go down well with your readers yes because my readers are busy moms and busy moms don't have a lot of time to read i think the novella um i think that there's a lot of romance uh genres and things that have figured out that the shorter fiction resonates with readers who don't have a lot of time and uh i i I honestly think that a lot of other genres could test out shorter formats and find out that there's a readership for them yeah, interesting. Um, in terms of your marketing, Elizabeth, are you uh, just tell us what that setup looks like for you. Are you in KU, for instance? No, I've done I've done experiments with it, but um, I'm strange in that my novels sell for nine ninety nine in the store and have since twenty fourteen. Uh, my novellas sell for four ninety nine. Again, I know who my audience is. I know that they just want a story from me. They know, and I know that they want me to stay in business. And so one of the ways I can stay in business is I know I'm not going to sell as many books as, like, say, a cozy witch mystery or maybe a space opera, but I will sell enough at that price point that I can keep going, that one book will sustain me, you know, two or three months worth of money to keep going, which is how long it usually takes me to write a novel. Okay. I think the fastest I've written a novel is six weeks, roughly, because I dictate. Now I use AI, but <laughs> I use both dictation and AI. But um, So my marketing actually was just post chapters. I would because I, it was like two birds with one stone. I have to write these chapters anyway. And I would post the chapters and at the bottom of my chapters, it'll say, thank you for reading this book. It's available for pre-order here because I'm pre-order or plus 15 other Jane Austen fan fictions at these fine retailers and they can click the buttons. And then I blog those chapters out um, and people still buy the books, even if they read it for free on my website. Mm. And that also helps me not feel guilty about my price point because everybody gets my book for free. So it's, because readers can't give you a tip. If you're priced at two ninety nine or three ninety nine, it's not like a reader can go, "Oh, this is really good. Let me give you a tip or something like that to keep you going." Yeah. So, what's this book worth to you? Should it come to you a week after you've bought it, and then you pay for it, deciding what you think it's worth. Idea for Amazon. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, this serialization worked for Dickens, so it obviously works for you as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you and ma- it keeps my readers engaged. They know that I'm working on projects. Yes. Yeah, so developing your reader base has obviously been a key part of your marketing. Yes, very much so. And I was lucky that there was already a reader base that kind of existed. But that happens with just about all the public domain properties. Even if you were following, if you were doing, you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and you you keyword your blog post of Robert Louis Stevenson and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and stuff, you're going to get um, some interest from people on the Internet of just following it and everything. Or a twist on a classic. I mean, there's so many... 
there's so many ways you could market this that it's going to get people interested because they want to see what you're twisting and how you're twisting a classic. Yes. So I'm already, my mind's already turning now to look at the, the outer copyright point of some authors. And if you're uh -huh. clever, you know, if you're five years out, you can have a series of four books ready to go literally the day. It's, it's, I think it's 80 years, isn't it, after their death. The day that yes. it becomes a public domain, all uploaded, and you'll be the first in that uh, in that queue. I, I guess people have probably yeah. worked this out by now. Um, possibly. I'm not sure when uh, Tolkien goes uh, public domain. I'm looking that up real fast. And it does depend on the country. So that's the other thing. Yeah. Um, the UK actually has books go into the public domain earlier. So you could actually publish a book just in those countries where it's available and then wait and publish it um, in the other countries when it's available in those. It does sound like a fun oh, thing. Oh, no. No. Yeah, Tolkien's a ways away. I think it's uh, 2044. So that's, there you go. That might be yeah. a little too far out there. So the one I'd like to do is Douglas Adams, but um, I think he died in the 80s, late 80s. So I've got a bit of a wait, wait for that. Um, okay. Let's talk about AI. You mentioned AI. We talk about AI from time mm -hmm. to time on this podcast. Joe Penn is a huge advocate of this and, and somebody who's very keen on, on, on keeping abreast of the industry. Mark is hugely cynical about AI, although I noticed he's now using ChatGPT to write his taglines and using it for copy and stuff. <laughs> so you've mentioned you're using AI in your writing process. Just tell us exactly what you mean by that. So I've been using Pseudowrite since November of 2021. So before ChatGPT even existed. And I've published three books since then. Uh, a great example is A Testifier that I talked about before. Mr. Darcy is a fireman. Yeah. Uh, I write a lot of ballroom scenes. I've, I've written 25 books in Jaff. So when you are in a genre where you have to write the same tropes in the same scenes over and over again, authors will tell you like, uh, uh, not so, another so for, ballroom So this is the equivalent scene. of a spicy romance writer talking about writing a sex scene again, and they're sort of running yes. out of language to describe it. The ballroom scene is, is Jane Austen's sex scene, isn't it? Kind of, yeah, it's very much so. Um, and people have nicknamed pseudo write sexo write because they can right. write sex scenes for you, and it doesn't it doesn't moralize like ChatGPT does. Uh, but uh, so I was writing the ballroom scene, and I used the describe feature, which the describe feature you just highlight something and you click describe, and it'll give you all five senses and two metaphorical. Which I think a lot of authors that helps because sometimes we're skimpy on the details or we just don't have the we just don't have the creative well that day to, to really get those rich details painted in to the scene. And it talked about the heavy scent of tobacco cloying in the back of your throat with a honeyed mixture of molasses. Wow. And I, I, I was like, I'm sold. And yeah. I didn't even think to put the scent of tobacco because in the United States, we live in such a tobacco free society, especially now. I, my, my childhood, I can remember yes. yellow nicotine walls at restaurants and stuff, but when they when they made their law changes, I just don't think about it because I don't smoke and I'm not around smokers. But um, I was like, well, brilliant. Of course, there was pipe and tobacco smoke and it would have been different than the kind of tobaccos, the filter stuff that we're used to. And so I put that in there. And a mentor of mine who's a New York Times bestseller and checks on my stuff from time to time messaged me. And he was like, I just looked at the beginning of your new book you have really bumped up in your writing skills. I felt it in the back of my throat in that room. And I was like, that was the robot. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't me. Wow. But it is me because I prompted it and I made the decision. The AI is not capable of going, oh, these words should go in here. This word should come out. It, it, it's, not, it's not capable of doing that. It's like, you know, sitcoms, they have a writer's room, yeah. like, a, like a sitcom TV show. There's a whole writer's room where people can spitball ideas and, and everything like that. And then there's usually one person who's the lead writer or the head writer who's going, yes, yes, no, fix this, redo that. So I think of my artificial intelligence, my pseudo write as like the junior interns in the writing room. You're spitting and stuff And then they out. submit to me, yes. And I'm going, yes, or I'm going, no. And I'm prompting them of what I want. Yeah. And one of the areas that's under discussion at the moment is the is the potential legal aspects of this and the fact that some writers this is i think more in the art world seems to be the example given rather than writing but it's going to happen as writing as well artists saying that they can recognize their work that's being influencing the ai and then spitting out is that is that something can happen with pseudo write or where does pseudo write learn from no, so all of the um, writing algorithms learn the same way you and I have with the stuff that's freely available on the internet to read. 
And I know a lot of people are like, well, some of that was copyrighted. I agree, but it didn't, it's not reproducing those. It literally read it and learned from it, which is available to anybody at any time. All the social media posts, all of the fan fiction and stuff that was posted freely to available. My own chapters that I posted freely. So I can actually tell the, I, the AI to write in the style of Elizabeth Ann West. And it's pretty bang on because my stuff was indexed. Um, since the dawn of the internet, these spiders have crawled the websites and has have read the content there. That's how we've had stuff indexed for search engines. So we've all we've all agreed to these uh, this system. Um, sometimes the terms and conditions for like fan fiction sites and everything, it was in there that your use of the system basically says that the website has the ability to make that information freely available, what you what you've written. So use kind of became permission, unfortunately. But we've all benefited from this. Um, AI is actually predictive. So if you have your phone and you text somebody, you know when you start typing the letters and it starts guessing what word you want to write? Yeah. That's the algorithm that you use with writing. So it's literally predicting the next word. It's not copying and pasting from anywhere. Um, so the more uniquely that you prompt, the more you'll get uh, unique information out. Now, if I ask the AI to write me a story about Spider-Man, it's going to write me a story about Spider-Man. But that's not the AI's fault. I was the bad human. I was the one who abused the tool. The tool itself doesn't do the abuse on its own. A bad human or a bad actor has to force it to do the trademarked characters and things like that. Yeah. And it, I think it's going to be hard for any writer to say that was my style unless I had a very, very obviously distinct style. And, um, and the trouble is, the difficulty with this area is that, I mean, I'm writing an espionage novel now and I've read John le Carre uh -huh. my whole life. So, of course, John, and I'm reading his last book as I'm writing this. Everything's derivative, right? It is. Everything's derivative. So, you know, where does that begin and end? I think with the artist stuff, the visualization of something that, you know, if you say, do me something like Edouard Munch, I don't know if he's still in copyright or not, and it does versions of The Scream, and you try and sell that, that's what I think you can't say, well, it's an original work of art. Edouard Munch's copyright owners would say no. So I think that's, I don't know if it's going to happen in writing. But but even in art, I mean, Warhol didn't own the Campbell Soup labels. No, that's true. So, yeah. so art, art, the art world also has some... Um, kind of contention there that that they, they also have precedent and things like that where everything is derivative and um i i know how i think that that's going to shake out honestly in favor of the ai believe it or not because the way the ai is doing it it's not taking the image and making adjustments to it it also looked at images and then it's generating pixel by pixel a unique new work now again bad actors can I ask it to do something in the style of Lisa Frank? And it looks very Lisa Frankish. Mm. Absolutely. So the better prompt would be RGB or neon fantastical colors or something like that. So yeah. better prompting, ethical prompting is what we're going. And this is why I got involved because I was scared of the AI myself. I mean, it's frightening when you watch what it can do. But I figured the best solution was for me to get involved, to start teaching people how it works and start teaching people the right way and versus the wrong way to use it. Okay, so tell us about PseudoWrite, how, how we can use it, where we can find it. Sure. PseudoWrite is pseudowrite.com. It's S-U-D-O-W-R-I-T-E, which is super do in the Unix world, not pseudo like false foot in Latin. Okay. But um, pseudo, <laughs> I know, PseudoWrite is, it's the little junior co-writer who's never tired. Like, if you want to work at three o'clock in the morning, PseudoWrite's there for you. People have been naming it like Trevor or Maria, <laughs> they named their co-writer. How, uh, how, surely is what I'm going to call it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so 30,000 words for $19 a month or 90,000 words for $29 a month. You can use it to help your descriptions. You can use it to help your dialogue. You can use the rewrite function. So you can put your words in there and then you can highlight something and you can say rewrite to have stronger verbs, for example. So you can use it in a lot of different ways. It doesn't just have to write for you. If you are somebody who struggles with prose writing, like I'm someone who I would dictate usually, so instead, what I do is I use something called guided write, where I will feed in my plot point and it'll say like, Mr. Darcy receives a black lined letter uh, on his desk. He pauses. He's afraid of it. And then he's interrupted by the housekeeper. So I'll put that in there and then it'll write me anywhere between 100 to 400 words of what that scene could look like. Right. And it'll give it to me in two different options. And then I'm going through it and going, yes, this, no, that, change this, move this line here. I want this one here. So 
there's still a lot of human involvement in it. The AI cannot write a book for you with one click. It, I don't even know that it ever really could for a while because the narrative logic that's required to keep 50,000 words straight, it can't, it can't remember what it wrote um, 10 chapters ago. Actually, it can't even remember what it wrote one chapter ago. It can only really store about 1,000 to 2,000 words worth of um, information at a time so can, and, and it, to work from. It can answer your question there and then and do what you're asking it then. It can't take into account what you asked it to do last week, which is the first 35,000 no. words. Okay. It'll need some time for that. It'll be a while before that happens. I think Sudora has some advantages over chat GPT, which has suddenly broken through, isn't it? Uh, suddenly everyone's talking and trying to get on there. It's uh, usually uh, full. but uh... So chat GPT is a great place to, to start learning. I teach prompting is do what, how. So you give it a verb, you tell it what to do, like write me a chapter. And then the how is all that secret sauce of like, write me a chapter that's a suspenseful spy thriller, espionage. Uh, with a car chase and an explosion and these things and, and chat GPT can give you like a big chunk of words. You can then take that chunk of words and bring it in a pseudo write and pseudo write has what I call the laser tools because you can literally modify with AI just a line at a time or even a word at a time. And I think that those are those are the tools that authors most often need because we just need an assist. We most of us like write love writing. So having those laser tools of I just need to fix this one wonky part or um, the expand feature. Sometimes I'll highlight one sentence at the end of a paragraph and the next sentence, and I'll stick in the middle. I don't know what goes here. Write a transition. And then sooner write will give me some transition ideas because I suck at transitions. That's one of my Achilles heels when I write. So wherever your pinch point is with writing, pseudo write can help. Okay. And um, just tell us about the subscription charges again for pseudo write. <laughs> sure. Uh, the best plan for most people is the $29 a month for 90,000 words. Okay. And if you buy yearly, obviously it's cheaper. There is a 300,000 word plan on the monthly level, which is slightly more than $100 a month. And to just get started with it, um, if you just go on the monthly, because it's a slider, um, the monthly is $19 as a hobby student, and that gets you 30,000 words. And we have a Slack community, so we can help you help you learn how to use the software. Has this sped up your novel writing process? Immensely. Um, more so... So when you're actually doing it, it doesn't feel faster. Just like the same thing with dictation. A lot of people, when they start with dictation, they don't feel faster. But then when they start comparing word counts, they're like, oh. So I can get about 2,000 to 3,000 clean words in less than an hour using the AI and working with it, with my plot points. Wow. And that's where it's not necessarily doesn't seem faster on the surface. I don't, it cuts off one of my editorial passes because the AI typically writes grammatically correct. So there's far fewer typos. There's far fewer missed words which was my Achilles heel when I write and I, I do sprints. Like I'll type for 20 minutes and sure, I can get 1,800 words, but it's a mess. There's missing words, there's misspellings. Um, the other thing I think that AI helps me on is days I don't want to write. The robot can help me get 500 or 1,000 words. And usually if I can just get that, yes. I can go. Yeah. And I also can write a lot in pseudo write as well. Sometimes I just use it as a safety net. If you suffer from blank pageitis, I don't even use the AI sometimes. I'm just sitting there and I'm writing the scene and typing it in there. And I'm comfortable because I know that help is just a button click away. And just knowing it's there, that support is there and I'm not alone, allows me to to push through the kind of the creative naysayer in my head that says I can't do this because it's like, yes, I can. And if I need help, it's a button click away. It's been an unusual interview when I think back. <laughs> Start with Jane Austen and finish with robots. But then there is probably yes. robot Jane Austen fiction somewhere. Pride and Prejudice and Robots. That's go. what we need to do next. Pro it's probably been done. I'll check it first. But uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Well, well done uh, on your your success in getting a job in that uh, industry. I know you've been a big advocate of it. Thank We've you. spoken about it at the conference and, and so on. Um, I'm starting to check things out more seriously. I have used ChatGPT. I, I played with Sudorite, I think, in November with you. But I will have a look at it again and uh, see how I can use it as a writing aid. I think it's... One of the problems is people come in at it from a distance and think, well, I, you know, robots can't write my book. And that's as far as they think about it. They don't think about it in the nuanced way you've described it as a, as a tool to help you construct your novel, which is uh, probably worth trying. Yes. More, more technology. OK, Elizabeth, the time has flown by. It's been really fun catching yeah. up with you. Are you going to be on the road uh, at the conferences this year? Yes, I'm actually teaching AI at Vegas this year at 20 Books to 50K. I'm not sure if I'll be at Neek or not this year, but I'm going to try. So okay. but I know I'll see you guys at least once this year. Yeah, superb. Excellent. Elizabeth, thank you so much. 
Thank you. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There we go. So, yes. I mean, Jane at Austin Fan Fiction covers all the genres. I mean, there's zombies. Yeah. There's science fiction. There's Pride uh, and Prejudice and Zombies. Was it Was it a film or, or a book? Or well, possibly both. But, yeah, that was 10 years ago, yeah. I suppose, when we were we were working at BBFC. That, that, that was a thing. So. Yeah. And then there was the ITV series here in the UK called Lost in Austin, which was time travel, Jane Austen. Um, where she went back and then mucked things up because she really fancied Darcy. <laughs> um, my wife loved that. Um, yeah, Jane, I mean, it's such a tribute to Jane Austen, one of the wittiest, brilliant, most brilliant writers. I mean, it's, you wouldn't think it's my genre, so, but I've read Pride and Prejudice twice. I've read Emma. I absolutely love You wouldn't think books. it was your genre either. No, Is there any jets in it? Any kind of <laughs> no, aviation? No military. No military. Jane Austen. Horses, horses and carts. Yeah. Take like a fast cab into London. Um, yeah, just very satirical, very funny. I think when you understand that they're comedies and they're satirical, the books are very, very enjoyable. If, if when you're a kid and you're reading them for O level or you know equivalent uh, academic studies, I think they can come across as crusty and staid because you don't realise she's mocking her characters rather than them being taken too seriously. But brilliant, brilliant writer and lots of interesting theories about her, which we heard actually from Elizabeth about who she really was. We learned a huge amount about her. Good. Uh, just a reminder, we have our TikTok training. Do you remember the URL for our TikTok training, our live event, which is on the 27th of February at 9 p.m. UK? Do I remember? No, of course I don't. Selfpublishingformula.com forward slash learn TikTok. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. I shall be hosting that one myself. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much indeed to Elizabeth and West. And uh, you'll get all the notes. We mentioned quite a few different things to go and look at, uh, including pseudo rights. But you'll see all the links in our show notes at selfpublishingformula.com. That's it for us this week. Thank you to the team in the background that bring this uh, show to fruition. We'll see you next week. All that remains for me to say is it's a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with the self-publishing show.